Does anybody know where John Smith's at? Sir, I'm right here, sir. And the leader of that group runs back to that, that soldier. He says, John Smith, just because you're present doesn't mean you're in position. As a Christian, stop playing around with demons. Stop playing around. Because I'm going to tell you, you're going to get yourself in over your head and you're not going to be able to get out. You're, not, you're going to get in and you're not going to be able to get out. And you're going to run and you're going to ask for help and you're not going to get any help. Because God's been calling some of you. He's been nudging your heart. He's been nudging your heart. He's been tugging on you to go to another place with him. And you keep ignoring him. If you keep ignoring him, there's going to come a day that that door is going to shut like it did on the, on the ark. It's going to close. You do realize that when you die, mercy's over, right? You, you do understand the mercies of God ends when you die. There's no more mercy. There's judgment. Now I'm getting really old school on y'all. You didn't think I was old enough that I could go that way, will you? But just hang on. Judgment begins when we die. It's at that point that you and I will all go stand before the Lord and give an account. And if we do not have an adversary that we have leaned on while we were on this earth, there is no more mercy. The mercy has to happen before that moment in your life. Some of you are playing games in your life. Some of you are playing games with your relationships. Some of you are playing games. And God's been tugging on your heart to get out of this. Why? Because he's got a greater purpose. He has an anointing on your life. He has a calling on your life. He has gifts in your life that people are waiting for you to get a hold of it so that you can be a dispenser of who he is in your life. Are you a dispenser or are you a receiver? You were made to be a dispenser. But if all you do is take, if all you do is take, the water in your pond is going to grow mold. I remember when our little boys, when we lived in North Carolina, and Jana took them, we were renting a house from some people. And they had a 10-acre pond, a lake, down at their house. And they told Jana one day, they said, anytime you want to bring the boys up, let them swim, that's fine. You remember this? Because they would ride their jet skis in it. They would have a good time. And so Jana got the bright idea one day because it was a great idea. She took the boys up there to go swim. Do you remember going swimming in that pond? When she got out of that water, I got a phone call. I said, hey, how's it going up there swimming? She said, not so good. We're getting out. I'm like, well, that didn't last long. And not give you a ham sandwich or anything. Like, well, what happened? You know, I kept waiting for more answer. She said, when the boys got out of the water, they had leeches all over. I know they're a little messed up. Now, I'm not saying that that's what did it. I'm just, no, I'm just <laughs> They're probably thinking that's what messed me up. I probably got in that water too much. I'm just kidding. But sometimes we swim in waters that put leeches on us spiritually, and we don't even realize it. Listen, if you're swimming in water that's got leeches in it and you look in the mirror and you don't see any leeches, it could be on here on your backside, on your right buttocks, and you can't see it in the mirror. Guess what? That means that somebody else is going to have to tell you that it's there. That's where we, have, that's where we go sideways. Because we don't want nobody telling us things like that. Hey, you got a leech. Hey, <laughs> You need to be careful. Don't swim in that pond. Hey, parents, listen, you know what? The greatest communication gap is between parents and teenagers. I'm just telling you right now. I'm just telling you, it's the greatest gap in the universe. If I could, if I could figure out how to close that gap, I'd be a multi-millionaire because I'd write a book. I'd write 12 series on it. I'd make millions off of it, especially if I had results. Well, I mean, I kind of do. I got perfect kids, so I, you know, maybe I should write a book. And, uh, and their dad's perfect, and their mom's perfect, so why wouldn't they be perfect? You know, it, it, it really, I, I, I really had to change my attitude when my kids were growing up because I, at first I wanted to get mad at them. I thought, well, man, they just, they, 
did, did their brain fall out at night? Like, what, what happened? Did, did, did it just leak out? I mean, I'd, I'd walk in the room, look for a puddle of water. I think, well, maybe it drained out overnight. I don't, I don't know. And the Lord said, they learned how to let their brain drain out because you let your brain drain out. They learn it from the best. Here's the problem. I learned this real quick. There, my weakness that I have to overcome in my life is typically not the weakness that our children have to battle. They battle their weakness in another area, but with the same set of tools that you battle yours with. If they had gone through the battles that I've gone through, I could have coached him better. But because maybe he went through a different set and Josh went through a different set and you went through a different set, sometimes it's hard for us to grasp the tools that we need to grab because it looks different than what we walk through. Here's the problem. We learned how to manage our sin. Our kids just don't know how yet. We've learned how to camouflage our weakness. We've learned how to camouflage our sin. We've learned how to look religious and say all the right things. And let's just be honest. We're all a wreck and we need Jesus. I just may be a little bit further down the road than my kids, but I hope that I can show them something that they can grab hold of as they get older to go, you know what? Dad might have been a little weird. I got he did say something. And I was all free. Where all that come from? I want to talk to you today about being present but not in position. A while back, and some of you guys may have been there that day, but we were over at Sterling Boulevard Church of Christ with those guys. Was anybody over there in that men's meeting that day that we had with uh, Pastor Steve Gill? He made a statement that day, James, that stuck with me. It was like somebody took a brand and iron on a cow and sent it. Man, it went right onto my chest. Talking about being present, but not in position. You have that picture. Uh, I, I want you to get a visual for just a second. Because a lot of times this is the body of Christ, okay? This is the body of Christ. But let's take the guy over here on the far right-hand corner. You see him over here right on the edge of the screen up on the point of the group. Let's take that guy. First of all, I don't know what his name is, but let's just say his name is Smith. John Smith. That's a basic name. So John Smith's in position. But let's just say that they had orders, that they all had to be ready in position for this picture at 8 a.m. in the morning. But let's say that John Smith didn't get there till 8.01. And John Smith, rather than looking like a goober and running out in front of everybody, let's just say all the barracks were over here and he had to run in front of the whole group to go get in position. Let's just say that John Smith said, I'm going to look like an idiot, <laughs> excuse me, to run across all these guys and go get in my position. So he's going to run all the way around the edge of the woods where nobody can really see him. And he's going to position way back on the back side of that road. And, and Jonathan, when y'all were at Police Academy, did y'all do roll call when y'all got in formation? Did y'all ever do, any, they call your name out? So, you know, whatever. So just bear with me as I badger this illustration up. But if, that, if the leader of the squadron is getting up there and he's going through his checklist, he goes, John Smith! Here. Looks around. He looks over there in that position. He's not there. John Smith! Here. Has anybody seen John Smith? Sir, I'm back here, sir. Does anybody know where John Smith's at? Sir, I'm right here, sir. And the leader of that group runs back to that, that soldier. He says, John Smith, just because you're present doesn't mean you're in position. Most Christians are present, they're just not in position. Say that again. We're present, but guess what? Being present 
without being in position is not being there. He got marked on the report that day for John Smith. He was not in position. Because position is more important than being present. Everyone in this room has a gift. Every one of you has a talent. And you've been present, but you've been out of position. This is not about giving your money in the offering. This is not about coming to church. This is about living a life of obedience. Living a life where we pursue our Father in heaven. Because guess what? He's pursuing you. He's not pursuing you because he's mad. He's pursuing you because he loves you. He's pursuing you because he wants to help you. He's pursuing you because you want to bless him. But he keeps calling out names, and he hears this muffled noise from the back. I'm present. I'm present. John Smith was considered not in position and even considered not present because he wasn't in position. We are living in a time, in a season, that the enemy is very excited that he has lulled most of us to sleep. We don't think it's important to be in position. We don't think it's going to make us look good if we get in position. As we shared on the story of Jacob recently, that when Jacob, Jacob wrestled with God, it said that God touched the, the, the socket of his hip. And he walked away with a limp. But he said, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wonder. I'm not telling you I formed a doctrine or a theology. But I'm starting to wonder that if you don't live your life with a little bit of a limp from wrestling with God, then you may not have wrestled with it. There's going to be a little bit of limp that's in our life. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I'm not talking about bad things. I'm talking about good things. There, there was a visible difference in Jacob's life because he had been with the Lord. I, I, don't, I don't want to be religious. I just want to know that I've been with him. I just want to know that I've been with him. I don't want me being with him to be an outward sign to you that you go, oh, wow. Oh. But I'm after. We have an audience of one, but we have so many voices that we give attention to in our life that we create an audience that I don't think was ever designed for us to live in or to entertain. I want to read something in Luke chapter 21. If you've got your models, Luke chapter 21. Twenty-five and twenty-six. Luke chapter twenty-one, verses twenty-five and twenty-six. <clears throat> And it says in verse 25, Luke 21, I'm reading out of the New King James, it says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations. And I just want to say that when it says distress of nations, that means the distress of ethnic groups and groups of people. Let me, let me just clarify that. It doesn't necessarily mean a whole nation like India versus America. It may also represent ethnic groups of people. So it says there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations. I would have to say that we're dealing with the distress of nations even within our own nation, a nation of people with differences. It says we're with perplexity. With perplexity. The seas and the waves roaring. And here's the part that I want to say. 
It says that men's hearts failing them because of fear and the expectation of the things that are coming on the earth or the powers of the earth will be shaken. This scripture has always stood out to me and I've always just uh, thought it to be funny. Not funny, but just interesting to me that men's hearts would fail them because of fear. I want you to think about it. I want you to chew on that for just a minute. Men's hearts failing them because of fear. Fear of what? It goes on to say of the expectation of the things coming to the earth. Now listen. There's going to be some difficult times on this earth before Jesus comes back. It's not going to just be peachy king and Jesus is going to come back and then there's this tribulation. There's going to be difficult times. Jesus talked about all these things are going to happen before he comes back. He said, all these things are going to happen. He said, but the end is not here. It was after this that right below it, it says, when these things begin to happen, you need to look up for your redemption draws not. I shared this a few weeks ago, if you remember, in the second service, that I made a statement that I felt like the Lord wanted me to say. Said that the Lord has hidden his hand from the enemy. You remember that Sunday morning? It was like a deck of cards. The Lord has hidden his hand from the enemy. The enemy doesn't know what the Lord's playing. He, he, he wants to know. He, he tried to do this with, when Jesus was born because he had, he had the king, the, the ruler of the land, to start killing all the firstborn male children. Why? In an effort to kill this prophesied Messiah that's coming. He tried to do mass destruction. The, the enemy always tries to do mass destruction before God does something. So we can judge by the signs of the times that we're living in that when there's mass destruction going on, that we know that God's fixing to do something. This is not about a political party. This is about God wanting to do something in the earth. I believe that there is a great awakening coming to our country. I truly believe that there's a great awakening. But I will tell you this, it's not going to come without persecution. Man, I don't want to be a prophet of doom. Man, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I believe that God's a good God, and I don't think he's changed his mind on being good. You know what I'm saying? But when you look at our government, and, and James and I were just talking right before the service about all the different things that are in place, that are in position right now in, in our government that are at stake. Um, you may not like the way I preach, and you may not like the way I deliver it, but the message is true. You and I better not go to sleep in the next 30 days. If you do your normal routine the next 30 days and you don't adjust something inside of you to be aware of the condition of our nation and you don't pray, you missed it. I'll tell you, you were present, but you weren't in position. You got to understand something. I say these things because of my gift. I'm slanted toward prayer and intercession. I'm slanted that way. Okay? So <laughs> prayer and intercession is not your thing. You just know I'm pushing. Coach Mark's pushing a little bit, okay? I'm not telling you how much and how to. I'm just telling you you need to do it with a genuine heart, with sincerity. We have a lot on the line. We have a lot on the line. Look. I shared this Friday night in prayer. It's irregardless of who you want to be president. But the bottom line is we know there's a lot on the line for our nation. Between, between the House of Representatives, the Senate, and our presidential position, there's a lot at stake. We have to call on the name of the Lord. We have to. Please, I'm begging you, do not do what you've always done. If this doesn't wake you up, then nothing will. If COVID-19 didn't get your attention, what will? What, what, what will it take? I remember after 9-11, we lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was doing a lot of tournament fishing, bass tournament fishing during that time of my life. That's what I enjoyed to do. And I can remember after 9-11, most of you guys were just still babies. So, uh, wow, hearing, hearing you talk about timelines in your life, I was like, 
Oh gosh, that was only five years ago. Like, man, if I could just enjoy, think about something five, that was not, I'm thinking, I'm making reference to 20 years ago, Chad. But I remember living in Charlotte, North Carolina after 9-11. And I can remember wanting to go fishing. We canceled our tournaments for that month just to kind of, we just couldn't do it. I remember the very first day I went fishing by myself in my boat after a period of time after 9-11 and I felt so weird. I was on that water that day fishing and I felt so weird. I thought, I'm out here enjoying my fun time. People have lost their husbands and their wives in burning buildings. Couldn't, in, in, listen, I'm, I want you to hear me because my heart was grieved for those people. And I was out celebrating my fun time, but my heart was with them because it was broken for the disaster and the tragedy. And, and I say that to tell you that I felt so awkward being out there, I couldn't even think about fishing. I thought about the whole time what had just happened to our nation. I feel that same way now. I feel the same way now as I did then. I told Nikki in the first service, I said, we, we even have a list out there that we were going to do a dinner, a little soup night and a movie night on the 15th, on a Sunday night. And I called her up right as the first service began. I said, we're not doing it. I said, we're going to have a night of prayer that night. I cannot sit here and eat a bowl of chili and watch a movie knowing that our nation hangs in the balance. I can't do it. I can't sit here and eat a bowl of chili and be okay with that without me having an opportunity to get on my knees and pray for our country. I know you think I'm weird. I know you may think I'm odd. But I love this country. I love this country, and I hate to see the battles that are going on. I hate to see the struggles that are going on on both sides of our, of our parties and our nation. I hate to see the spiritual battles that are going on in our country. I'm burdened. I'm grieved in my spirit. That grieving is to pull me to a place where my father is standing the gap for. Him. Every one of us have a responsibility. I say, man, you're being heavy. I don't know us how to be. I don't know else how to be this morning as I'm grieving for our country. I shared this with a few folks the other day. I, I really debate even sharing it because I don't want to be misunderstood, but the night after the election, that next morning, I had a dream. And I had a dream that I was standing in a room with Donald Trump and some of his administration. And the next thing I know in that dream, I walked over and I was sitting on a couch and President Trump began to walk over toward that couch to sit down. And he looked me right in the face and I saw the tiredness in his face. I saw the weariness in his heart. And he sat down on the couch beside me and he leaned over on me. And I remember getting my arm, just like I would one of my kids, I just... I just had such compassion and I just put my arm around him and I remember getting a pillow and laying it in my lap and I just said, Mr. Trump, I said, just lay down and rest. Just relax, just rest. When I woke up, I just, I felt like the Lord said, Mark, I'm asking you to pray for him. Give him a place to rest in your life. Will you give the leader of our nation, if he's only the leader of our nation until the middle of January, Will you give him a place to rest in your life that you honor the, the God of this nation to pray for the leader of this nation and the leaders of this nation? There's been presidents over this country that I never voted for and I didn't care for, but I prayed for them as much as I have I've prayed for this one. Will you, will, will you get out of your world for just a little bit and let God use your heart and your voice to pray for this nation. Pray for the leaders of this nation. Not just the ones you like, but pray for the ones you don't like. 
that God will bless them too. They need it. We'll probably have less come for our 15th, the Sunday the 15th prayer night than we would a chilly night. Okay. Okay. Once your life is over, you don't get a do-over. You know that, right? You don't get a do-over. You and I don't get to talk about good intentions. Well, I, I, I was going to, but I got busy at work. Or I was going to, but, I, you know, my kids were baseball. Look, I don't, I don't think God's upset with us because we do things like that. I just think there's moments and times that we have to slow down a little bit and let him have our attention. That we seek his face when there's critical situations going on in our world. If you don't take the time in your life to set before the creator of this earth and this nation and this world, if you and I don't take the time right now, you'll never take the time. Quit fooling yourself. Quit kidding yourself. This is not a Trump rally. I'm not trying to do a Trump rally here, I promise. Just saying, I'm only going to tell you what I felt like the Lord showed me. I have an obligation to pray for that man because of what the Lord showed me. I have an obligation. You know, the Bible says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. It doesn't matter what happens over the next 60, 90 days. We still serve a father that's our father, and he's our creator, and he's going to watch over us regardless. It doesn't really matter. But I'm not going to take that approach that I'm not going to go wrestle with him for the things that I believe are true in my heart. I'm going to fight with him. I'm going to wrestle with him. I'm not going to let you go, God, until you bless me. I read this last Sunday night when we were at our, our worship night. And Jesus heals a blind beggar, and it says, And Jesus approached Jericho, and a blind beggar was beside the road, and when he heard a noise of the crowd going past, he asked what was happening, the blind man did. And it says, and, he, and someone told him, they, they told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. I love these stories when it involves Jesus doing something different than just walking through a city. And these people told him, said, it's Jesus, the Nazarene, that's going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd hollered at him and said, be quiet, man. But he only shouted louder, son of David, mercy on me. And I love what the scripture says here. This is Luke chapter 18. Verse 40. When Jesus heard the man crying out, when Jesus heard him, it says, he stood still. Stop. Jesus walked up to the blind beggar and he said, what can I do for you? He said, I want to see. He said, I want to see Jesus. You know what you can't do? I'll tell you something you can't do. You can't keep a desperate man or woman quiet. Do it. The crowd kept telling him, be quiet, dude. You're acting weird. Be quiet. When a person gets to a place that they're crying out to God, you're not going to be able to keep them quiet. Especially, especially 
when they begin to hear the footsteps of their creator getting closer, closer, closer. Beggars cry out. He said the crowd was following him, but only one beggar, a blind beggar, was the one crying out, making the sin. I hope every day that when the sun comes up over killing Alabama, I hope every single day when the sun cracks the top of the trees, that Jesus and the Father are hanging around in heaven. And the Father's going, what is that noise? Grigsby, Lord. Father, it's Grigsby. Now, y'all know that, right? No. Every day, it's the same thing. Hey, Jesus, Son of David, mercy on my Do they hear your name around the throne? There's two ways I think that, that they hear your name around the throne. Jesus said, when they confess my name to others, I confess your name to the Father. Hear that? When you share Christ with others, he's sharing your name to the Father, going, Father Jonathan's down there sharing Jesus with you. I just want to let you know, Jonathan's down there sharing you with them. And the other is, is to call out on him. There's two ways. You're either calling out to him or you're calling out to the world. I don't want my name to be talked about around the throne. Don't you? Even, even if I'm being a nuisance in heaven, I, I'm telling y'all we all get to heaven, y'all not going to hang around me. Because I'm going to be the guy around the throne going, y'all got to get out of the way. <laughs> I got to get in there. Be quiet. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you don't know what I had to go through to get here. I had to use a little bit extra blood and sacrifice for me to get here. I got to get to the one who loves me. I, I got to get to the one that recreated the way I think about life. I've got to get to him. I, I hope one day when me and the Father see each other for the very first time, I hope the Father jumps up off that throne and gives me the biggest hug, because man, I'm gonna be running to him wide open. Whew. Here I come. I'm fixing to belly throp flop the throne of God. <laughs> Y'all all gonna walk in holy. Y'all gonna walk in off. Like, what's up? What's up? I'm gonna be like, yeah! Woo! I'm running in, man, dude, just like Jonathan does when he walks in my house sometimes. That's what he does. He comes, you know Jonathan's walked in the house when he comes in my house. And that's the way I want to be when I get to heaven. I want them to hear me screaming from one side of eternity to the other. Kevin and Lori's going to be sitting down, eating a nice meal in heaven. They're going to go. And then somebody's going to say, hey, did y'all go to the last song? They're going, mm -hmm. part of the time we did you know him? <laughs> yeah, and then I'm going to go jump up on y'all's table and I'm going to make a scene. Can you believe it? When I run in that throne room, Jesus and them angels crying holy, they're going to stop singing for just a little bit when I run in. I'm going to say, holy this, I'm here with y'all. Do they know your name in heaven? Or is it just on a scroll? Are, are they going to have to look through the scroll to make sure that's you? Or are they going to know? Here, here's what I know. The, the Lord says that the Lord bottles up our tears. Did you know that? The scripture talks about he bottles up our tears. I have this feeling that when we walk into the throne room, there's going to be a lot of bottles sitting there, and there with our names on it. Some of y'all are thinking, <laughs> They got some tractor trailer loads of tears up there for me. As long as it's got your name on it, that's all that matters. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, 
Have mercy on our nation. Have mercy on this nation. Have mercy, Lord, on this nation. Let the foundations of righteousness establish this country forever. May the spirit that's killing our children be cut at the root. May the spirit that's causing men to marry men and women to marry women, may that spirit be broken off this nation. Let that be broken. Let the spirit that causes Christians to become complacent be broken off this nation. I'm sounding the alarm today but if you're not waking up right now, you never will. You do realize, you do realize that the parable of the ten virgins is that five were wise, five were foolish. That scripture has multiple meanings. One, Israel and the Gentiles. Israel, they didn't recognize the Christ. He sounds the alarm that he's coming. They're going to miss it because they, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But it also applies to us as individuals, whether Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile. It says that there were five wise and five foolish. Five kept their lamp full of oil, five didn't. This is they all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. But when the alarm was sound, and they all jumped up, Bob looked at the wise that were not foolish and said, hey, can you give us some of your oil so that I can make this, this ordeal? Or I won't have enough. I want you to hear me. You're not going to get what you need from somebody else. You're going to have to go to the main source. I can't do for you what he can do for you. I, I, I can't give you what you need from him. You're going to have to go get it for yourself. You, you may want me to bless you, and I can bless you. I can help you, and I can encourage you. But you've got to keep your own lamp full of oil, and you've got to keep your own wick tree. That's your job. It, it wasn't the job of the five wise to take care of the five foolish. You understand that? We have a responsibility. Let's keep our lamp full of oil. Let's keep our wicks trimmed. Let's be alert. Let's don't, let's, let's, let's be sober minded. Let's don't be intoxicated with fear right now, okay? Because fear and discouragement and depression and hopelessness wants to come over this nation. But it's not. I know I've probably badgered this up today, and I'm sorry. I apologize. If I didn't articulate all this the right way. But I, I won't. I, I, don't, I don't like it when we walk out of here with heavy hearts. But sometimes we got to walk out of here with a heavy heart. Not in depression. Not in hopelessness. Not in discouragement. That somebody has got your attention. That might shake you out of the normal routine of your life. That you might just do something different tomorrow. Some of you have a gift of prayer and intercession on your life and you're sitting on it not doing anything with it. Some of you hear the voice of God all the time. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, I'm, I'm sure that I have badgered this up really bad. But Lord, I just ask, Lord, that anything that I've said today won't represent me, but it'll represent you. If I've just totally screwed it up, God, just forgive me. But Lord, I hear the cry of the Spirit saying, come unto me. Call unto me, and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't even know. Lord, I decree and declare over this nation that this nation is healed. I decree and declare over this nation that the mercies and the grace of God will prevail over this nation. I pray, God, for our president that you would touch him and give him rest, give him wisdom. Be with his staff and administration. Be with everyone in the Senate and the House of Representatives. May the Spirit of God blow through that place. 
Lord, we decree and declare that righteousness will prevail in this nation. Darkness has no place. The, the darkness will be exposed by the light. Lord, we're calling on the name of Jesus today that you would heal our land. Lord, help us to turn our hearts from our wicked, selfish, lazy ways and call out to you, Lord, that you would heal our land, heal our lives. Help us, Lord, to turn away from sin and destruction. Help us turn toward the truth and life that only you would. But Lord, we bless you. We declare over Lauderdale and Colbert County that the Holy Spirit has full control over this area and this region. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of our own communities. Lord, if you'll help us, we'll do more. We'll do more than we ever can, God. We'll get busier bringing more encouragement and more hope than we've ever brought before. And so, Lord, we love you and we bless you. And we just decree and declare today in agreement that Jesus is Lord over this nation. And that the hand of God is showing us favor even this day in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Hey, this is Pastor Mark. I hope you enjoyed the message that you just heard. If you did, would you please hit the subscribe button below and also the bell notification. So the next time we post messages from Lifestone Church, you'll be notified when they hit online. Also, we'd love for you to connect with us on Facebook and on Instagram. And if you're interested in being a financial partner with us, you can go to lifesongchurch.tv and hit the giving tab and you can give online to help us in many different ways that we're trying to reach our community. God bless and we hope to hear from you soon.